hello and good afternoon or morning to everyone joining us from around the world uh, and welcome to our webinar, uh, joint webinar with Sectigo, uh, using PKI for business continuity and the secure remote uh, workforce. Um, we are um, we're partnering with, our, uh, with Sectigo, who are platinum partners, and we're privileged to, uh, to welcome Jason Sirocco, who is the CTO for PKI at Sectigo, and Tim Callan, a senior fellow uh, at Sectigo, both of whom have over 15 years experience uh, in public uh, trust business, uh, and whom both run a popular podcast called Root Causes, which I'm sure they'd like to uh, put a plug in at the end. <laughs> I'm sure we will. <laughs> May I just say, just before we start, um, it's it's going to be around about a half hour, 40 minute presentation. Um, it, if you anyone has any questions, please take the opportunity to uh, to write them down within the app and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible after that. So um, without any further ado, uh, Jason and Tim, over to you guys. Thank you, Frick, so much. This is Tim Callen, everybody. And uh, hi, Jay, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great, Tim. Thanks for having me. So uh, for the um, for the listeners, Jay and I, as Frick's mentioned, we do a, a popular uh, podcast where we're on there a lot. So uh, we kind of do this back and forth thing all the time. So Jason and I will run through this today. Um, but a little bit of a start here. So obviously the business environment today isn't what any of us imagined it was going to be on January 1. And we've seen a huge change in focus among the IT professionals that we talk to on a day-to-day -day basis about what they need to do. And um, probably not really this is a surprise, but you know, we've, we've seen other ideas and projects lose a lot of their attention as people have turned to focus on an immediate problem, which is I have to take a workforce, make it remote, make it remote securely, make them productive. Um, and for a lot of people, this means moving to something like desktop as a service uh, that, that wasn't really used in the mainstream, but, but now it is. And so, you know, over the last 100 days or so, you know, we've seen a lot of enterprises take that particular focus and orientation and approach. Um, but at the same time, there also has been an awareness, and we think this is healthy and important, an awareness of the fact that not only do we need to get our people at desks in their homes productive and secure right now, but also we need to ensure that when these kind of disruptions come along, that our business continuity will maintain at a basic level and that we can rely on things continuing to run. And so we've had a lot of those conversations as well about what, what you do, how you use identity mechanisms and PKI to ensure or help ensure that that happens. Um, and then the last thing that we've seen, again, over the last few months is this extreme urgency, right? Oftentimes someone's working on a project and they're trying to save some money or they're trying to you know, enable employee productivity and they can, they can look at something like six months or a year as a time frame that they can consider for these projects. Uh, there's this incredible urgency, right, where people need this done ASAP, literally ASAP. And so these three uh, uh, factors have greatly changed the conversations that we at Sectigo are having with the C-level and, you know, manager level IT professionals that we're in conversation with on a regular basis. And so what Jason and I wanted to do today is just kind of walk you through uh, where PKI fits into this new landscape, how you can use it and how it's involved. Do you want to add anything to that, Jay? Yeah, sure, Tim. Perhaps from a, from a technical standpoint, one of the challenges uh, that, that you're trying to solve especially from an IT standpoint, and more specifically a security standpoint, is the fact that you now have a lot of employees who are trying to cross hostile network boundaries where they used to be safely ensconced within, within an enterprise network. And that, that really is going to be the focus of what we're talking about today. Great. So, um, 
obviously we we're seeing a very different risk profile that we saw before, right? So part of this is, as I mentioned, the secure access need, right? And this isn't just user logins. It's more than that. It's what machines are they on? What mobile devices are they using? How do we know that those are secure? Uh, how are they how are they getting onto Wi-Fi? <laughs> right? All of those things become questions that you need to start thinking about. Um, and then disruption of processes, like we talked about, right? So all of a sudden you take people who are used to going to a certain physical location and they have their desks and they have their papers and their coworker that they talk to is in the desk next to them and they can turn and ask a question. And all of a sudden they're in a different environment with possibly different processes. Maybe they're accessing things in a different way. And this leads to potential problems with just good old fashioned security flaws, of course, with lost productivity, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. I don't have the info I need. And then also, it really opens up the door to social engineering attacks. Um, you know, when 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 normally I would have covered some information in a face-to-face -face meeting with my team that we have every week on Tuesday morning, now all of a sudden I'm getting emails and uh, uh, you know chats and things along those lines. And that's the opportunity for a malicious actor to insert themselves in a dialogue and convince somebody that they're that they're part of the team when they're not and potentially cause you to do things that you shouldn't do otherwise. So all, all of these potential problems come with process disruption. And we actually saw a very real dress rehearsal for this on a much, much smaller scale in the 2018 to 2019 time period in the in the December 2018 to January 2019 time period and I'm talking about the US government shutdown so um, uh, a quick reminder for everybody in that time period the Congress could not pass a spending bill and the government shut down for 35 days and that is a very long US government shutdown normally they'll shut down for a day or two every you know, four years or so when, when they can't pass a bill. But in this case, they shut down for more than a month. And we sat and watched government services just go offline because a bunch of people who went to work all day, every day, like normal, one day were told, stop coming to work and stop coming to work last 35 days. And what they didn't do was, oh, update that certificate that was due for expiration, for instance, because they had been told to stop coming to work. And so we just sat and watched these things go down. Jason and I were uh, already working on our podcast at the time, and it was kind of incredible. We podcasted on this. And um, there was actually one, one source, Washington Post, documented that in a single week, 130 government services stopped working correctly due to certificate expirations. So imagine that, take that and multiply that by all enterprises, governments, schools, nonprofits, et cetera, around the world. And you can see the potential for business disruption is absolutely vast. And so doing something about, about this and, and ensuring your business continuity is a very valuable exercise for enterprises to be thinking about right now. Jason, you want to add to that? No, that's great, Tim. I think that really what we're talking about here, for those of you again who are technical, for 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 those of you who are Linux administrators, it really is not about uh, you know doing less or, or or transferring from a from a to a different job. It's more about thinking about automation in the sense of uptime for your enterprise and making sure that the tasks that are best left to a computer are left to a computer. That's going to be the theme that Tim and I talk about the most. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, we, we, you know, uh, uh, we, we talk about this a lot, but well, I'm sure we'll hit this here. So um, one of the things that we should do is we should talk about passwords. So obviously, if you got a bunch of people and you're going to put them at desks and you're going to put them in various places and you're going to give them some kind of access, you know, VPN or whatever, um, give, them a, give them a credential, right? Give them a username and a password and get on with things. And of course, passwords definitely provide some potential problem here. So I've got some problems listed, Jay. Maybe I'll bring them up one at a time and you can, you can say something about them. So 
private key never leaves the client. Yeah, so what we're talking about, Tim, here with this first bullet point is fundamentally the strength of public key infrastructure, or PKI. Whenever you're dealing with things like passwords, uh, whenever you're dealing with things like symmetric tokens, what those essentially are are shared secrets. So, Tim, if you and I wanted to do business together, uh, you, you know, I right. could tell you, come over to my house, knock on my door three times, and then if I hear those those three knocks, I'm pretty sure it's you. The problem right. is that agreement of the three knocks, first of all, is not a great secret. And secondly, <laughs> uh, I had to tell you what that secret was so that we both knew it. Now anybody listening to us probably knows that secret as well, therefore is not a secret anymore. So therefore, oh, yeah. so the, fundamentally what a private key is, it's, it's, a, it's a private part of a secret that never ever has to be transmitted between people. In other words, if you can keep that private key safe, and therefore the private key never leaving the client, it is right. fundamentally stronger than any form of shared secret. And the right. biggest form of shared secret that's used today, obviously, is a password. Yeah, because that shared secret is going across the internet. Um, next. Oh, we might be able to hit this quick. The private key cannot be, therefore, the private key cannot be stolen in transit, right? I think that's the, 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 the therefore from what you were just saying, right, Jason? That's, a, that's exactly right, Tim. All right. The private key cannot be stolen from the server repository. Especially if the server repository is using things such as a, a hardware uh, secure element, uh, sometimes TPM, sometimes HSMs. They come in many form factors. Right. Yep. The private key cannot be broken by brute force. This is a big one too, right? Passwords can be guessed. Um, people use a lot of dictionary words. People use tend to use a lot of the same things and a lot of the same patterns. Um, uh, there are a number of ways that you can try to break a password that you don't even just have to use every you know, possible combinations of letters and numbers and special characters in a row. You know, it's not all ASCII values times uh to you know to the 12th right it's not that it's much less than that in terms of the real world passwords that are probably used so passwords are guessed on an extremely on on a regular basis or also passwords are reused right if i find out your password for one service i can try that for another service and oftentimes that'll work uh none of this happens with private keys Tim, is that a typo? It might be. A, I think you meant to write the password may, can be broken by brute force. So that's all right. Oh, private key cannot be broken. Thank you. Cannot be broken by brute force. That's a very important point. The private key cannot be broken by brute force. Thank you, Jason. This is the problem with humans. This is where, where uh, we make mistakes. There's a good example of a mistake. Um, and no need. Right, unlike passwords that need to be updated and stuff, you can assign someone a private key, and for the for the duration of the certificate, have a high degree of confidence that that security will endure until the certificate is replaced. Yes, but right. you can have short lifespans of private keys, uh, or mm -hmm. more specifically, you can have short lifespans of certificates that can contain a private key, but that process of renewal will often be seamless to the user. So, so yes, so we do not recommend passwords, right? We do recommend PKI in its place. Um, and then here's a little stat that's just to back this up. This was from Verizon's data breach report in 2019. They say, okay, they, they take breaches and they take a certain set of breaches out, right? Um, uh, so, so they say, okay, if we remove the breaches that are error misuse physical action we look at the remaining set of breaches among those 62 percent of them are uh involved by stolen credentials or brute force attacks so you know this is a major vector for people coming in and successfully breaching organizations in the real world and you know that's why that's why we we talk about it so um so you go okay not passwords. What about other things? Well, I'll give everybody a token. I'll give everybody a hard token. I'll give everybody a soft token. And um, 
those have their problems as well, don't they, Jason? Yeah, indeed. Uh, hardware tokens specifically, and remember, we are talking about COVID-19 pandemic conditions where things have to be done quickly. The problem with hardware tokens, I mean, and there are a few, um, that I would say if, if you're a CISO, a CIO, having to get those shipped to your employees who are currently all at home, that is probably one of the main yeah. factors is it's quite slow to get into people's hands. And uh, the older form of hard tokens, which, which Tim, we used to call RSA tokens, right. uh, which have the, the, you know, the, the one-time passwords that you have to you know, key into your computer, even that itself, uh, you, know, you can question, is that a second form of authentication when even though it's a physical device you're holding in your hand, that's generating a one-time password. The problem is that password typically has to be typed into a computer, which may be compromised. Right. Um, we could probably have a whole uh, webinar or podcast session just on the problems with that form of MFA. Yeah, so I'm keylogging you, and you sit and you type in your, your six-digit one-time password generated by your token, which is good for the next 45 seconds, and um, I zip it off to my own server and I use it, <laughs> right? So um, that doesn't really solve anything. Um, and then soft tokens have some of the same problems, plus they have the additional problem that you're sticking this thing on some unknown BYOD device, right? A phone or a tablet, and you don't know what's going on with that device. And if there's a problem with that device, then that's the exact same thing. The soft token software might be compromised, might be spied on, etc. Sure, Tim. Are we going to let's talk about SMS just for a moment? Sure. Um, I, it wasn't, you know, I, I'm thinking of the, the number of years I, I was in the field and still am when when I, I hopefully get to visit customers again after this pandemic. But for those of you who may be tempted to implement SMS as a form of second step or second factor authentication, um, where, where the the server itself, uh, something within the the enterprise network is sending out a text message. Um, uh, I've demonstrated at least five ways, I've personally been able to demonstrate at least five different ways to attack SMS back in the day when I used to show those kinds of demonstration. Not the least of which now is uh, SIM swapping, which, which unfortunately is a problem that I don't think the carriers have really come up with. In other words, any form of, of authentication that relies on there being a static uh, phone number for an individual person or device is problematic. Uh, but it, I think NIST, uh, the United States body that, that regulates a lot of, of gu guidance and standards, uh, they've, they've probably said it best. And they've deprecated SMS as a recommended form of multi-factor authentication altogether. So, of course, um, PKI gets around these problems. And, um, you know, you can see, uh, uh, you know, you've been all been looking at this chart the, the, while we've been talking, but, you know, it, it, is, it is not only more secure, but also just a much better user experience. I mean, the last part we didn't hit about with all these problems with these tokens is it's a terrible experience, right? I'm trying to get online, I got to stop and I got to fish up my token, I got to find this credit card form factor out of my wallet and I got to stop and type the thing in and, you know, I'm worried what if I lose it, what if I don't have it? You know, it's in my other coat. All of these kinds of things happen, and they they hurt productivity. They create help desk tickets. Uh, they create anxiety for employees because they're always worried about that, that that's going to happen, and that just becomes kind of part of their life. And you can get around those problems with a PKI-based approach. So. Um, uh, certificate automation. So, 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 you know, we talked a lot about securing the remote f workforce, but let's change gears a little and let's talk about this business continuity pro problem, right? We talked about what happened to the U.S. government. People stopped reporting to work and these services started going offline. And what happens if your employees stop reporting to work because they're sick or because they have people who need care at home or, or they or maybe they're just distracted, they're tired, they have lots of things going on, and um, they can make errors, right? They can 
not make it to work today or they make an error or something else happens and you can have services go down because certificates aren't managed correctly. And of course, the approach to defend yourself against that is automation. And when we say automation, we don't just mean automation of renewal, although obviously that's the example I used was, was definitely about renewals, right? When you've got these certs, they're due, they're expiring, and you need a new cert to be put in place. Um, but also, some of these other factors are very important. Automation of deployment. So when I'm creating new services or when I'm expanding my footprint or anything along those lines, you can use automation right there to deploy your certificates and know that they're going to be the correct ones, they're going to be installed correctly, it's all going to be error-free. Uh, and it's just much more efficient. It's a better way to run things. Um, and then uh, uh, discovery, which you see way over on the left, is very, very important, right? The idea behind discovery, and we talk about this a lot, Jason, don't we? This idea of rogue certificates or even rogue CAs. And, yeah. Yeah, so rogue CAs is probably one of the, the biggest things to worry about, especially when you're trying to rush things during this time of COVID-19. Uh, and this is an, a, a problem in all forms of private PKI, especially uh, because of the fact that there are a lot of things uh, such as robotic process automation and DevOps, especially where the instruction is to, to your technical staff is to set up a certificate authority. And a lot of times the instructions just to get people going will be to, hey, download this open source certificate authority and just fire it up with some basic Linux commands and that should start pumping certificates into your system and away you go. Problem is, I think a lot of the technical staff that you might have which are not savvy to public key infrastructure don't realize that there's enormous risks in not protecting that certificate authority properly. And that is, in fact, Tim, where you know we've spent a very large chunk of our professional lives yeah. is in how to how to actually protect those CAs. So yeah, so you have a bunch of there's there's a bunch of things that can happen, and this one you talked about is right, is a CA that's done wrong, and then guess what? That CA has certs, certs are issued against it, and once again, those certificates are going to expire. <laughs> so think about this scenario, somebody who isn't really a PKI professional who's responsible for putting some system in place, puts in a CA, uses that CA, issues a bunch of certificates, all those certificates expire in a year. Um, somebody's not watching that because this person isn't a certificate professional, or maybe this person isn't on the task anymore. Maybe this wasn't an employee, maybe this was a consultant or an agency. And then what happens is a year later, all of a sudden things stop working and things stopped working because these certs expired. And this goes on. Um, and the same can be true. You don't even need to have the private CA, right? It could just be uh, somebody in the organization is working on software and they go get some certs, right? Oh, won't run without certs. Let me go get some certs. And they get some certs and they throw them up. And that isn't the person who's responsible for certificate administration. That person doesn't know the best practices. That person isn't paying attention. And guess what happens? A year later, bang, stops working. And nobody knows why. One day, all of a sudden, things aren't working and we don't know why. And we all run around with our hair on fire and it turns out that it was an expired cert. And this goes on all the time, right? Yeah, Just in the to, last, yeah. Go ahead. Even to major organizations. And I guess, Tim, the, the, the point I, that I really want to drive home here is uh, the reason why we're mentioning this again is because we really fear that in, in the COVID-19 era right now, in the rush uh, to get yeah. things productive, that these mistakes, which are already common, even in large organizations with the resources to handle it, yeah. I fear that we're going to see this uh, a little more that this exact scenario you said of, yeah. of people just downloading certificates from just somewhere and then expiring through time. I, I hate to see what things might look like 90 days from now or a year uh, from now. Absolutely. You got somebody says, this is an emergency. It's an all hands on deck situation. I just got to do whatever I got to do to get to home plate. And then, oh, okay, everything's running. Woo. Put it out of my mind and don't think about it again. Well, you're going to think about it again in 365 days, right? And and so you're exactly right, Jay. And so part of what you can do is the good thing about discovery is um, 
it's a little way to, to backstop yourself on this, right? You can go and you can say, okay, what corners maybe got cut over the last three months? And, oh, I found all of these certificates I didn't know about. Great. Let's get them under management. Let's get them compliant. Let's get them under automated renewal. Let's put them in our reports and our dashboards. And all of that really helps. Um, and that is something that you can do. And that's where discovery matters. But of course, discovery, once again, that's an automation function. The way you do this is you have something that crawls through your space and it finds these certificates and reports them. So, um, and um, one of the other things I think that, that that's worth pointing out is that we're not just talking about a simple environment of you know own servers sitting in racks in a in an air conditioned room you have with a drop floor like that's that's not the real environment we're in you've got to think about all of the places that you have digital identity needs right you've got stuff going on in public cloud and more than one cloud surely uh, you got DevOps environments. We talked about remote employees and BYOD and um, a lot of different systems, right? Like once upon a time, everything was just Microsoft stack in the enterprise. Um, and that's not true anymore. We got Linux and Microsoft and, you know, we got, uh, you know, Apple desktops and all this stuff is all kind of mixed together with IoT devices, with BYOD devices, with public cloud, with DevOps applications and all of this stuff has PKI and all of this stuff has certificates. Um, and so this is, you know, this is part of the reason that there's a lot of interest in zero trust these days. And zero trust, you know, PKI is, is a foundational part of implementing a zero trust style approach. Right, Tim, at the top of this webinar, uh, when, when we were introducing ourselves, uh, I had mentioned the technical fact that you now have a lot of assets, uh, a lot of people that are sitting within hostile network environments, namely their homes and their home Wi-Fi's as an example. Perhaps some of those people, you know, in the near future still might not be working at the office, but maybe they'll take it to a coffee shop outside who, who, when the weather gets nice. Who knows where these people will be working from? But the one thing you can be assured of is that's a hostile network environment. And that's where zero trust comes in, in that you you, you live in this world. You're going to now be native to this world where you, you, have, you have digital nodes, you have assets, you have people that all need to authenticate into your safe network from hostile network environments. Therefore, you need to think about each of these devices, each of these people, as the identity of them needing to be protected. In other words, the security is now at the atomic level. It's not a general concept. What do I mean by that? This really has to do with the old idea that anything that is behind your enterprise firewall is safe, so you don't have to think about it anymore. Right. Yeah. Uh, nobody's just sitting safely ensconced behind your firewall. Everything is sitting within a hostile network environment and needed to be trusted, uh, needing to be protected in such a way that they're not inherently trusted, which is where, why we use the term zero trust. Yeah. And, 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 and even without all these environments, like history is full of examples of enterprises who said aha well i've got a secure firewall around it so i don't need to worry about what's inside it's it's a green zone and then something hostile gets inside and they just run 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 rampant right so that's where you need to say you build your systems with the assumption that no firewall that you 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 build is impenetrable and you you allow for that and you provide for that you take steps to protect or mitigate damage even under those circumstances. So, um, and I think we talked about this, right? Uh, uh, or Jason, just real quick, uh, uh, NIST has published a zero tr its Zero Trust Architecture Guidelines. It's their special publication 800-207. It's very current. 
and um, they do define PKI as an essential part of, of uh, public trust. And so this is a great document to go read. It's available to everybody. If you just search on NIST 800-207, you'll find it. It's the first thing you'll find. And, you know, they make these things available to the world. So um, uh, now the last thing is fast deployment. So uh, I mentioned at the top of this webinar that um, people have these needs really right now, right? The remote workforce need right, is right now, but also the business continuity risk is right now. And so one of the things that we've found, again, as we talk to lots and lots of IT professionals, is there's this assumption that these are long projects. People go, okay, well, if I get going on this now, then you know maybe by the end of the calendar year, it'll be up and running. And so we just, we just wanna take this moment to say, that is not the, the case, that is not a, a requirement at all. We, we believe that anybody who wants to do this can and should aim for deployment in not more than 30 days. Um, and we do this with customers all the time. So, yeah. yeah. Tim, yeah, th this is an enormous sea change that, that we've witnessed in the past few years where public key infrastructure and more specifically key management and certificate management have changed so that we can boast to being able to bring customers online uh, for private trust scenarios in, in a very short order compared to what it used to be, uh, say, right. you know, more than five years ago. Yeah, so if you looked into this five years ago and you said, oh boy, this is going to be a custom development project and I don't have the developers and I don't have the savvy and I don't have the time, it's worth taking a, another look because things have been updated in a significant way in terms of the deployability, the automation, and the usability and you know this what you love to call purpose built pkij is a very real thing now where you can get uh you know get something that is with a little bit of configuration ready to go <clears throat> so um all right so I promised you we would do this. So Jason and I do run a, a podcast on a regular basis. It is called Root Causes. We go deep on all kinds of different aspects of PKI and digital certificates, including everything that you we talked about today and more. Um, just search for Root Causes PKI. You'll find it wherever you listen to your podcasts, you know, iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, et cetera. We're on all of those places, and we would love to have you join us. And with that, I think we are ready to go to questions. Let me see if we have any questions here. Uh, okay, I see one, hold on. I'm figuring out this interface. Okay, here we go. So, um, oh, so okay, here's a question. I guess this came up while we were talking about automatic discovery. What kinds of certificates can automatic discovery find? So, so Jason, automatic certificate discovery. What what should they expect to discover? Sure. Uh, for the, for the most part, anything that's sitting in the file system or in a directory. Uh, that's that's the short answer. Longer answer to that is publicly trusted certificates. So SSL type certificates, DV, right. OV, EV type certificates. That's yep. we can find that on the file system of mm -hmm. web servers. And f there are also certificate types. Uh, the privately trusted certificate types as well that might be sitting around your network uh, that are employed for purposes of uh, perhaps VPN, uh, okay. perhaps for the purposes of desktop as a service, and other types of authentication uh, certificates that might be sitting either within an Active Directory service or, or sitting on a file server somewhere. The ones that are going to be more difficult are things such as IOT type certificates where right. the certificate may only be sitting, you know, on a on a constrained device out in the field somewhere. Sure. What about I, I would guess maybe code signing and document signing certificates you're not gonna find? Are you gonna find those, Jay? Yeah, you probably will. Uh okay. Tim. So uh, absolutely. So uh your your S MIME certificates for email, um, absolutely. And uh, additionally, um discovery of the of uh, of, of SSH keys that have been uh, put into certificates, which is a newer form of technology, but those mm. can be discovered as well. That's great. So that's maybe not all, but that is a whole lot 
that you can find and bring under management. And again, this can be public, but also private, right? It can be your own, your own CA as well. All right, so let's see, what's my next question? Next question is, okay, yeah. So uh, uh, the question is, so you, you, you say all these advantages of tokens, this, these disadvantages of tokens, why, why is it that people are still using tokens? Legacy systems, and tokens mean a lot of things, Tim, but, sure. but legacy systems that, that were always programmed, let's say old ERP systems that were configured you know, 10 years ago to use an right. RSA token are right. probably still configured to use that. Yeah. And so God help anybody who has to log into three or four or, or more of these systems because they probably have a very large keychain, a lot of holes in their pocket. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, but we're also, you know, tokens, uh, so there are forms of soft tokens, uh, which means that you could have a, a mobile app. I must have at least four different mobile apps I use right now uh, mm -hmm. for one-time passwords to be generated off my phone. Right. Um, so those are also forms of, of tokens. And tokens as well. there are also other newer forms of hard tokens, uh, you know, FIDO2 uh, protocol-based which uh, allow you to uh, to essentially have a a key pair stored in a a form of hardware secure element in in a form factor such as a USB stick, and uh, th those could also be considered tokens. So um, yeah, and so a lot of it is you've been doing it this way for a long time, and switching those systems out is 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 going to be tough. And that's sort of a, a long-term project, not an immediate project. Um, but certainly we would recommend, if nothing else, if you've got new access that you're granting that you didn't have before, you don't need to go the token route with that. If you're doing something fresh from scratch, you absolutely don't need to go tokens. You should, you should go a different route. Yeah, Tim, I, I think the point we want to drive home here is because this is a podcast around people trying to deal with COVID-19 from an IT um, perspective, um, going, getting away from tokens and moving towards client certificates and PKI is yeah. probably, you know, what we're trying to say here, I think it was the second to last slide talking about the, you know, the, the sheer speed at which you could, you could get your staff to be productive and authenticating in a secure manner probably beats the heck out of older fashioned hard tokens and shipping them to your employees and getting them all provisioned. I think right. that the, the, yeah. the, this is really the heart of what, what we're trying to say here. Yeah. Okay. Next question. So who uses the NIST guidelines? So we talked about the, the NIST, uh, uh, a couple, we talked about a couple things from NIST, um, uh, NIST deprecation of certain kinds of authentication. We talk about NIST zero trust guidelines. So the question here and generally is who uses these guidelines? What's the authority of these guidelines? So how are these, what's the concept, what's the significance of the NIST guidelines, Jay? Uh, there are a lot of different types of NIST guidelines. The guidelines we were, we were referring to in this webinar are specifically about zero trust. Mm -hmm. And the zero trust guidelines from NIST is really a set of principles on which your enterprise can start to think about moving away from simplistic firewall security thinking. Okay, firewalls so are great. Firewalls are absolutely fantastic. You would never build a car without doors. You'd never have an enterprise <laughs> without firewalls. Right. Uh, the problem is, is since you now have employees and and assets you have all sorts of digital nodes that are no longer just simply sitting behind that firewall you need to think about protecting those things at the atomic level in other words the identity of a device that's sitting outside of your firewall network needs to be thought about really hard and it's not just authentication it's also the authorization if you have a printer that's sitting out in you know somebody's um, you know, home network that's now, you know, connecting via Wi-Fi into the en enterprise network and that thing gets infected with malware, uh, you know, if, if you knew that that printer, which is now connecting into your finance network and your, the crown jewels of your company, you, you should know that that's a problem. 
And zero trust is a set of principles that really helps to get to the heart of this, this principle of least privileges holistically within your enterprise. That really is what it's all about. It's, it's bringing together a number of technologies, not the least of which is PKI, to have a, a better sense of a more secure environment for your enterprise. So think of the NIST guidelines as some very smart computer science people who were well-resourced did the research for you and put it all together in one place where it's easy, easy to navigate and read and understand. And you can use these to go away with you know, good principles. It's a how-to guide, as opposed to this being, let's say, a compliance requirement. So you're not gonna be audited against this. This is more that this is an asset that's available to you that you can use to adopt and operate this kind of you know, computing strategy, this kind of identity strategy in a, in a secure, reliable, best practices fashion. Um, and, and Tim, since yeah. you have this root causes slide up, we did actually have a, a podcast on this very subject for anybody who's really interested. Yeah, we had a podcast on every subject. <laughs> yeah, we did. Yes. Right, guys, um, just interrupt it. Yeah. It's, it's quarter to three, just conscious of time. I think we might have time for one more question, possibly. Excellent. I have one picked out, so let's do this and we'll call it. Um, so, and maybe we can answer this one co co uh, quickly because I think we've touched on this. The question is, zero trust is a complicated thing to implement. Can I really get this done in 30 days? So let me jump in here. I don't think we were suggesting that you would do a complete zero trust strategy in 30 days. Zero trust can mean a lot of things. There are many degrees of, of execution. There are many degrees of granularity and thoroughness and coverage. But I think what we we're saying is you could have a PKI implementation that would cover the basics you needed for digital identities for your um you know for all the different environments we listed and your work from home employees and there's every reason you could be up and running with that in an automated fashion in 30 days now zero trust involves policies and governance and all kinds of other things and that may take some time but you can get that that identity foundation up and running and you should expect that to be fast not slow do you agree with that jay tim let me give you a perfect example of this and then we'll finish this mm -hmm. off which is, let's say you're a CIO, CISO right now, you're pulling out your hair because of COVID-19, you gotta get your people productive quickly and in a secure manner. Um, one way that, you know, five years ago, two years ago, you might've thought about this is just to give everybody overprivileged VPN access with username and password. Bad idea, right? A lot of problems with that. We could have two, three, four webinars on the reasons why that, that, that could be problematic. I'll give you an alternative right now for you guys to think about, which is, desktop as a service. Uh, you now have people working from home. Goodness knows what computer they may be working on. Maybe it's maybe it's enterprise issued, maybe it's not. But you want to you want them to be productive within a controlled desktop environment. That controlled desktop environment can be in the cloud. Your your technical people in your enterprise can be controlling it. The the one problem that's left for you is how to authenticate your staff into that cloud environment, how, how to get them productive within that remote desktop. Well, it could be done by a very weak secret, a username and password. As we said at the top mm -hmm. of this webinar, is a bad idea. The better idea, set up a, a private PKI quickly and then get those, get, you get, get those employees provisioned with those private keys in a very secure manner and that will allow them in a zero trust type of, of thinking to be able to authenticate into that cloud environment so that then those people are now working with a, within a controlled and secure desktop environment and be productive very, very quickly. When we say a 30 day turnaround, that's the kind of scenario where you could go from disaster to everybody being productive in a very short order, Tim. That's what we're referring right. to. Yeah. So, so well said. And with that, I want to thank the audience. Thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you, um, Jason, as always, for an enlightening conversation. And thank you for having us today, Fricks. Thank you guys for coming along. Uh, and also just to echo, thank you everyone for, for joining us uh, back at home, wherever you are. 
uh, we will be circulating the slides uh, and of course uh, helping to answer all those unanswered questions that we didn't get to today all right thanks very much all thanks for your time and have a good morning or rest of uh, afternoon wherever you are <laughs>